Good afternoon. I am Derek Hogan here at North Georgia Technical College. I am doing a little video work here for Practical Machinists. Today we're going to go through the motions of setting up a taper attachment to run apart and also going to cut some tapered threads and we're going to go through and go through a inspection process on a tapered surface. So that's what I got for you today. Let's go inside and see what we got. Okay, what we have on this piece right here is a section of this piece right here that needs to be turned down to 1 8 um, 27 NPT. That's going to call for a three quarter taper per foot here. So, what I need to do on this right here is one, I need a machine that has a taper attachment on it. We're going to go ahead and rough the taper, and we're also going to cut the threads while we're at on this right here. So, if I look at this machine right here on this side right here, I have degrees. Over here on this side, I have taper per inches, taper and inches per foot here. So what I want to do on this right here is set this side right here to three quarters of an inch per foot. And that's going to allow me to cut my taper. Now it's going to be a little bit more than just verifying it here. I'm also going to need to take and use my digital readout to be able to tell how it's actually tracking there. So what I would do here is I have a screw here and there's another screw right here and I'm going to loosen those two screws up and then I have an adjustment wheel that's right over here. I'm going to adjust that wheel until my taper is correct for this. Now my bore in this case because I'm cutting an external taper is going to need to angle like you see here. So when I angle my bore in this direction right here that's going to allow you to actually cut the taper on the workpiece. It's going to allow us then to go cut the threads on that same taper. One other thing I forgot to mention here. For this to work, this has a little piece inside of there that you can see back in there that slides on this bar. Now, I need to have this locked in place. So I tighten this down on the ways when I get this in position for where it's going to cut my taper inside my piece. Now, I'm going to need to move this over a little bit right here. So one of the first things we'll do is loosen these two screws up so that we can slide this whole assembly down this way. In addition to having this tight, this also needs to be tight. And by having both of those tight, now when it moves, the end of my crossfeed rod is going to be pushed in or pulled out depending upon what angle I have. And that's going to allow me to cut my taper. Now, one other little thing. Inside my piece here, down in here, you'll see an adjustment screw, that one side. That adjustment screw is going to um, allow you to adjust the gibbs on this. Now, just like on any machine, you have to have an adjustment and to have movement. And the gibbs allow you to take up the clearance and adjust the clearance on that. So that's going to affect how it moves here. So what's going to happen when I get to move this it's going to move a certain amount this way right here before it starts cutting the taper. So that's one of the things you got to work with when you go to cut these right here so that you make sure that it cuts it in the proper space. Just okay. the now move this all down this way. So we want to get that rod where it's that rod is that bar is right there in between our piece there. Yeah, that should be good right there. Okay, so now I come back over here, tie this down. When you're not wanting to cut a taper, you loosen that that the clamp up, the clamp up there, so that basically this is all free to move. And I'd go ahead and check the tightness right here also. It looks like that's a different size, probably next size down. So that needs to be tightened also. Okay, now next step is going to be to loosen these right here. Go ahead and break both of these loose. These here? Leave these right here. Okay. So that one's already loose. Okay, come over this one right here. Do the same thing here. I 
made up for it on You may need to use the other end. Okay, good. Now, if you look over here, we have a vernier scale here. The vernier scale here is going to allow us to set this to the angle that we need. Now, in this case right here, we have we need to go to a three quarter. My main, what I see here, and this right here is my inch lines right here. So this is going to be a quarter, a half, three quarter here. So I want to line my zero up with this three quarter right here. I don't have to worry about the vernier scale in this case right here. So to do that, I go over here to this, this uh, little knob right here and I go to start making adjustments. And I would loosen this one up here a little bit more. As you can already see, it's beginning to move away from zero. Okay, that should be good. So now, I'm gonna adjust this right here. Should be able to cut just the taper. There we go. As I adjust that there, it's going to move away from zero. So now we're at a quarter inch. Keep going the rest of the way for me. Other way. We're about a half. Okay, stop. Back up just a hair. Here more. Keep going. And stop. Okay. Now snug these two balls down. One right here, one right there. We're probably not done with them, but this gets this ball work. I know. And that gets the initial roughing of the setup. Next step I need to do is I want to go ahead and zero both my X and Z out. I'm going to start moving my carriage hand wheel here. And as I move my carriage hand wheel, you'll see my Z dimension changes. And then my X dimension starts to change. That's how much backlash I have. Okay, so I'm going to go ahead and zero both these out. We're going to go back a little bit here. You can see I have about 470 something thousands backlash here. Now that's something I need to know because it's going to affect my how my cuts are. So I got to make sure I take that in consideration. So basically I need to start on my cuts at least a half inch off the end of my piece here. So it's actually cutting a taper by the time I get to the end here. So once again, what I want to do is get it to where I move it till both of these are moving. And then I'm going to start keeping up with where I go with this. I want to move over one inch. Eighty-seven thousandths. Nine sixty-five. Nine. There we go. One inch. I got sixty, roughly sixty-five thousandths there. Now, if I take three quarter and divide it by twelve, I believe doing it in my head real quick. I believe I get a sixteenth right there. Um, I'm gonna do that on paper here in a second here. Make sure. But I believe I get a sixteenth there, so I'm a little bit off, about two thousandths too steep. So what I would need to do is adjust that until it runs true. So um, what I need to do is come back over here, loosen our screws back up, and redo the adjustment back here, make it where it's slightly less steep. What I usually recommend with this right here is because I'm going the opposite direction. If you don't know which way goes one way or which way goes the other, you, it's the easiest to basically take and mess with the adjustment, move the adjustment the other way before you loosen this right here so you don't get the backlash in, in it. It makes it a little bit more predictable as to what happens here. Just make a slight adjustment. Very slight adjustment. We're talking two and a half thousandths over, over an inch. And then tie it back down. And we're going to rinse, wash, and repeat up here to double check and make sure it's correct. So we'll move it back to where, get to where I have movement on both axes. 
zero out both axes. Move an inch. And my math was correct, my middle math was correct on the 16th. So I want to see 62 and a half thousandths here. I'm at 62. So we went the wrong way. We're now at 66. So what you want to do here, before you go to loosen this, you know how you made your adjustment before, go ahead and move the opposite direction here. So you know which way to go. So when you loosen this right here, just make a small adjustment. This can take several attempts to get right. Tighten it back down. Come back up here. Move back. Start moving back towards my chuck again. Okay, then zero out both. Go about feeding over. We are right at it. Uh, it's one inch and three thousandths and sixty-two four. Really, honestly, for what we're cutting here, with the pipe threads we're cutting on that, that is more than sufficient. Okay, one thing I found was when I was moving around using different parts of this bar, I was getting slightly different results. Uh, it could be a little bit of difference in some wear in the bar. Um, this is an older machine. This machine was built in, I think, the late nineteen seventies, so it could. Um, not quite being specification there anymore. Uh, there's numerous things it could be. But one of the things that did come up when we were setting this up initially, and it's one of the things I've got to address, I'm going to address after we get done doing this, is this screw right here has lost the nut that goes on the bottom of it. There's nothing that actually holds allows it to clamp. So we're having to do this with one clamp screw, which is far from ideal. So what I found if I stay on this side of the bar, more like I would for traditional turn. Where I'm going to be turning it works out pretty well. So now if I go to check this right now and I move back past my zero then I come back this way right here. I want you to notice a couple things. One, when I get to zero on my Z it's going to repeat on my X value or really really close to it overshot a little bit there but you can kind of see the gist of it we'll go back here do this again come back to it 200 it's repeating pretty close now to zero here so eight ten thousandths of an inch difference there Go to zero both of these. I'm going to move over an inch here again. When I move over an inch, I'm going to get right about 62 thousandths is what I've been getting consistently. A little bit over 62, 62 and 8 tenths there. Um, that's pretty good for there. Now, here's the thing with this if this was a part that was a fit base taper, I might have to keep tweaking this until I get a better result. Because this is just an MPT thread, I, you know, this is perfectly acceptable. So there are times to continue to do the process, continue to adjust, and continue to try to get yourself where you're more in specification. But there's also times to realize, basically, I'm three tenths out over an inch. I'm cutting threads on this piece. That'll be okay because basically, really honestly, when it comes right down to it, setting my vernier scale here from the very beginning and just going with a three quarter dimension on it would have probably been perfectly fine. But, you know, there's also the matter of understanding how to do it right when you need to in that regard. Now, one other thing I do see here, um, this bar is looking a little beat up in some places here. I got some burrs right here. There could also be a little bit of damage to the bar here. I think when we replace this screw here, which I don't think is a real problem that we're having, but when I think we replace the nut that goes with the screw, I'm going to um, go about taking this bar and making sure this bar is stoned off and there's no burrs or anything that can affect the accuracy. So I had something interesting happen. We're getting ready to run this 
and I had something happen here. Okay, if you watch right here, I'm gonna turn my x-axis on the machine and it is not moving hardly at all well, it's moving a little bit but it's not moving the way it should move at all considering i've moved a massive distance here and it's basically that way across the entire thing so um i don't know why this happened yet uh, i think the i think the encoder went bad on the readout, I'm gonna be taking a look for the look at it, but I don't have time to do that, so I'm gonna show you another way to do the same thing, so we can kind of keep track of our movement here on this x-axis. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna put a travel indicator on the x-axis here, so we can see the movement. Now, for this to work, the indicator base has to be somewhere located on a non-sliding surface. Then we want to break it loose and. Position it around. Drop the indicator tip. That's the great thing. It stays up against a flat surface on the ship. Get up here a little bit higher to get off the engraving there. And we'll tie that screw on. So the whole reason for doing this right here is just to keep track of when it's actually moving. So when I get to do my cuts, it's actually going to be able to see when the movement starts to take place. So what I need to do is make sure I get far enough off my workpiece, about a half inch with what was showing earlier, so that when I get to my workpiece, it's already cutting the tape. So I can actually turn my diameter up. Still not really sure what's going on with this right here. It is reading, but it's not reading right. So I might look into the settings a little bit, see if somebody's changed my, my settings to something ridiculous when it comes to the units there. But I'm gonna let it go for now. Okay, now we're ready to make our cut. I'm gonna move over. As I move over, you should see my dial start to move before I get to my piece. It's not, so I need to start my cut a little bit further off the back. A little bit further off. So now I'll start moving back this way to here again. Should we'll see the indicator dial move? There you go, we got movement there, so we're good there. I'm gonna bring it over right here to this edge. Now, my compound is set right here to the angle. If I can bring it into I touch on my corner of my court piece to actually have myself a starting point for my taper here. That's a great way to work this right here. So basically now, when I, if I continue my movement on, we continue moving and all, but I have actually touched off my workpiece. To go about a half inch off, or more, so that when I come back to make my cut, it's actually going to do what it needs to do. Okay, funny story on this. Because we're cutting threads on a very short piece on a taper, we touched off, make one pass just to kind of go through the motions. And we kind of got to the size we needed to on the first pass. I needed it to be 405 at the top end right here. So we could go about cutting the um, threads on it to the correct size. And that's what we'll do next. But for right now, our diameter is where we need our diameter to be. Um, so what I'm going to do right now is I'm going to take this piece out, flip it around, and we go about, so we go about showing the motions of doing a cut on the back side. Okay, so now we got our piece flipped around. We got it on the other side, and we're going to go about um, just kind of going through the motions of cutting an actual taper on this piece. Once again, I have to make sure I have movement on both axes before I hit the part, or else it's not going to actually cut a taper. As I begin to move along, it's going to cut a taper and I begin to fade it out. So then I can move back off my part again, go back enough to take out the backlash. Now, backlash is not a fixed amount. It varies depending upon how steep your taper is. If your taper is steeper, it's going to end up with more backlash, less backlash, but less backlash. If it's more shallow, it's going to end up with more backlash. So you need to know how much you have so you can actually make sure you have a good part, especially if you're running a machine without a digital readout. Uh, indicator like I'm using here works well for that. Now. Think about making my cut here again. Once again, I have to have movement on both axes. 
And there's one interesting thing that happens here. A lot of times I've seen people reverse the spin, reverse the feed and feed backwards to take a little spring pass. That won't work with a taper attachment because of the fact when I go to back out, it actually creates clearance. If you look right down in there, you can see a little bit of a gap in between the tool and the workpiece. That's because of the backlash that's there. So that's going to give you issues with trying to do this. Okay, we switch back to our other piece. That's one of the great things about having a collet system, by the way. With a collet system, we can switch back and forth without losing the concentricity of our piece here. So this is still going to run if this is true and then we left. So what we're doing is we're cutting an 8 inch MPT on this piece right here. We're using a threaded insert here. And the same rules are going to apply that we would do for just traditional turning. But you know, we have to start our piece off the part a little bit and you know, feed in until it starts, starts to taper. We're still going to thread just like we would normally, you know, basically using our zero here to basically keep control where we're at and doing our end feeds here to go about doing our cut here. Uh, one thing about it, alignment on tapered threads. Our alignment is still going to be based upon a straight surface, not the tapered surface. Um, so basically our alignment here was set up based off on a straight edge so that our tool is properly aligned, not the tapered surface here. And as you can see, there's a slight taper there. It's not a very pronounced taper. But there's enough taper there that um, it's going to, you know, get progressively tighter as you tighten it down, and this is going to ultimately be able to do our piece. We're not going to finish this thread completely here today. I'm just going to kind of get through a couple passes on it so you can see what happens. One thing to remember on threading is you have to understand how to read your chart here. In the case of this one right here, we've got we're cutting 27 threads per inch. So 27 threads per inch is L A 2 S. I got L here, A right here, 2 on the gearbox right here, S right here. Now I've got to do a whole other handle over here. Well, this is one of the most common mistakes I see made on a causing wave here, on this generation causing wave, is people miss the fact there's a W right there. I have to use that W there, or that C if I'm doing metric threads, or the C and the W if I'm doing modular threads, or the Y if I'm doing feed rate to actually get it set up correctly. So I've got my W set here. So we're good to go on that. Okay, now we're going about cutting our thread here. And this is very similar to just your traditional thread process here. You know, you feed in the amount you need to feed in. Once again, that usually gets progressively smaller as you go. Um, you go in and you touch off on the outside. You've zeroed out your cross feed. You've zeroed out your, um, you got your compound rest set to, to go about making your cuts. And as you make your cuts in, it's going to allow you to go about following the same helical path over and over again. Okay, at this point right here, we're ready to cut our thread. So now, basically, we have fed, we've went to zero here. We've fed in six thousands here. We're waiting for our half nut dial to get at the right place. So what I'm going to do here is watch for this dial to come around. Now, I'm cutting an even odd number of threads with uh, 27 threads per inch. So I can use my numbered lines here, one, two, three, or four. I also could use my half lines, but I can't go back and forth. I need to use one or the other. If I'm doing an even number of threads, I'm going to use, can use any line. If I'm using a fractional, the safest thing to do is to use every, every the same line every time. So then I can go about engage my half nut and go and feed it in there. So we're ready to go. We engage a half nut when it comes around to a line. Now, one thing I typically like to do with this right here is I like to start my cut a little bit closer to the piece. In this case right here, I'm going to move over about a quarter inch off the piece. Having it a quarter inch off the piece allows me to have the ability to um, have a misengage and still uh, get unengaged before I hit the part, but also makes it where I'm not just cutting air for a long time. You know, if you cut an air, you're not making money. You're basically wasting time to go about making the process. So when it comes around here to the one, I'm going to engage. It's going to go about making my cut. Now, in this case, this is running pretty slow because this is a very short thread to a, a shoulder here. I want to make sure I can stop this safely. So when I go to stop, I'm just going to basically let it just fade itself out. I'm going to back up, typically a full revolution here. Move myself over, once again a half inch or more off my piece, feed back in. I like doing a full revolution here because it helps me keep track of where I'm at. That can be a problem if you got a deeper thread, but in this case this is a very fine thread here. 
I'm going to feed in about three thousandths here. Move myself back over a little bit closer to my part. Wait for my half nut uh, line, that, my half nut to line up on the dot on a number. And I'm going to engage and go about making my cut again. And basically, I'll just continue to make this process over and over again until I get done with this piece. But the interesting thing with this thread is here is this thread is being driven by the taper attachment, which is making the thread itself actually taper. And that's giving me a, um, a tapered thread just like you would have with a traditional pipe fitting. Okay, the last thing I wanted to show you today is a my one of my favorite methods of actually checking a taper to see if it's correct. Now there's other ways to do this, but this way right here works pretty well. So what I have is two one, two, three blocks. I have two pins. Now the diameter of the pins does not matter. They don't have to be exactly the same. The closer the better it is, is the closer the better. But in this case right now I got a 251 and a 252 pin. I'm not going to actually use that to check a measurement diameter. I'm going to use it to check the difference between two points on this piece here, one inch apart. I'm using one, two, three block. I'm using it on the two inch dimension so that I can actually measure that. Now, I'm cut. This right here is a center here that has a number three Morse taper shank on it. So if I look at my chart here, my number three Morse taper shank has basically 50 thousandths per um, taper per inch. So I want to see a variation of 50 thousandths over the inch here between my two measurements here. So what I do is take my micrometer and mic it. I'm going to do that and take a picture of the measurement. And I'm going to do the same thing on put my edge, my one, two, three box onto the side here like this. And take another measurement, like both of them that way, and take another measurement across there. And then compare the difference between the two. And I should see exactly 50 thousandths difference between them. Okay, one little thing. I've had this happen before and I didn't think about it. I've had some micrometers that are not compatible to do it this way because the micrometer will actually get down there. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to switch this out to two, it's two sets of gauge blocks. So two and a three inch gauge block. And I'm going to measure across um, those two points there. And the same concept applies. It's just I cannot use, in this case, with this pin diameter, I could not use a um, one, two, three block. I have to go to a bigger pin. So my first measurement is 1.391. My second measurement is 1.441. So I ended up with 50 thousandths difference between those two. Using the, the two gauge box, the two gauge pins in my piece. Now, once again, I could use my one, two, three blocks to do this. I just would have to change to a bigger pin diameter that would allow my body and my micrometer not to interfere. Um, it works that way. Uh, it's just a different way of doing it. Okay, now, other ways I could do this. I could technically make two scribe marks in my piece and mic at those two scribe marks one inch apart and be able to get a pretty good measurement. It's not as accurate as this method, but it won't be a bad measurement. So it's just something to think about if you need a way to do it on the machine and kind of get an idea of where you're at. Just make yourself a scribe mark two inch, an inch apart and measure the micrometer on the same part of that line. So if you use like this edge, the micrometer to measure one, use that same edge on the, on the other one. If you use the center, use the center. If you use the other edge, use the other edge. Just be consistent with it. Now, I am Derek Hogan. I am here doing some video work for Practical Machinist. Uh, be sure to like and subscribe. And if you have any questions, comments, or have any ideas for videos, be sure to post them in the comments. Thanks for your time.